it's a great pleasure to be at the Bayer 2021, although it would have been even better if I could have been physically present, enjoying the hospitality like always and be amongst all of you in this wonderful place. But unfortunately, it'll have to be virtual for now. So I'll be talking to you about managing uh, large sub retinal hemorrhages. Uh, let me share my presentation. So management of a large submacular hemorrhage. I think there are many ways to manage these entities and a lot of different uh, techniques are there about how one can go about uh, managing these uh, very difficult situations actually. And I'll just take you through a series of um, different types of cases uh, with the techniques that I've used so far uh, to try and remove these uh, to get the best out of uh, these eyes. So let me start by showing you an example of a medium size, not too thick uh, subretinal hemorrhage. Uh, the patient comes with an acute decrease in vision, and then you give a classic uh, gas injection uh, and, and positioning. Uh, you can see the gas bubble, and over the next few weeks, the, the hemorrhage clears away from the macula, and uh, eventually uh, the macula becomes clear. This is the OCT of the same patient, and you can see that slowly the OCT becomes normal and the vision starts improving and almost gets back to 6, 9 or so. But the problem is when you see a thick, large hemorrhage like this uh, encompassing the macular area and very thick. Uh, now, these are not going to be moved very easily with a gas bubble or any injection or anti VEGF or any such uh, uh, things. This is the other eye of the same patient. So typically an IPCV-like situation where a patient has lost one eye and comes to you with a with a massive hemorrhage like this. And that's where the problem is. So what I use uh, for these patients is a technique like this, where uh, first of all, go and do a vitrectomy, remove all the core vitreous, uh, which is there. You can see how thick the blood is and very solid looking, uh, the, the whole content. It's not liquefied like the subhyaloid hemorrhage. So first of all, go and remove uh, the, the whole hyaloid. Uh, also do a triamcinolone staining so that we know that the hyaloid is removed in, in total. So you can see that slowly the, the whole hyaloid is removed. After that, I put in some perfluorocarbon to check if the blood moves, but you can see that it doesn't move. Uh, so once the perfluorocarbon is in, I, I do diathermy to the temporal half of the retina uh, in order to create uh, uh, a sort of a, a area where I can do a large retinectomy. So uh, just beyond the borders of the diathermy, I cut the retina in the periphery and, and expose that whole area. Then the perfluorocarbon is removed, uh, and then I invert the flap of the retina, which I've cut. This is like a, creating a giant retinal tear. For this maneuver, one could use multiple instruments. You could also put a chandelier and then use by manual or uh, and, and gradually remove the whole uh, flap from the underlying thick tissue of blood that you can see. Slowly that whole area is exposed well and I, I gently uh, try to remove it by aspirating it with the cutter, nudging it uh, into the open. So the bare choroid is open and all the, all the blood over it. So gradually with suction you keep on debulking it, removing it. Uh, you're not worried about the retina here because you reverted it to one side. And, and slowly uh, as soon as all this blood clears up, the view gets a bit better and a small portion of the tissue with the membrane is remaining, which is getting cleared right now. And once you're sure that all that is, is cleared up gradually, the last bit of the tissue coming in, uh, and, and now this is a bare choroid. So after this, I again put in perfluorocarbon and now treat it just like a giant retinal tear. You can see that the whole uh, area where the blood was is now clear. All you see is a small atrophic area of the of the original area of the bleed, which has some atrophy, which you see, but all that bulk of, of blood is gone. So slowly fill it up with perfluorocarbon, do a good 360 laser, exactly like a giant retinal tear, and then uh, I put the retina back and put oil inside. This is the post-op picture of the patient. This is uh, a month after. Uh, you can see that 
the blood is gone of course a trophic uh, patch is seen in the central part so there is a central scotoma for the patient but the patient recovers back about 624 vision uh, in, in this particular situation this is another similar case that you see which i did uh, almost a similar type of uh, procedure where we move the the, the vitreous first uh, core vitrectomy uh, after that you trimcinolone stain so that i can uh, check on the hyaloid and, and remove it totally. You can see the whole halo of stained vitreous coming through. Uh, and then you know that the hyaloid is, is totally gone from there. After that, do uh, a, th a, a retinectomy in the periphery, a diathermy, and then do a retinectomy, expose that whole area. This was partly inferior, and so I, I did an extension inferiorly. And here you can see that now I'm exposing uh, the blood just like you saw in the previous uh, case and gradually debulking that whole tissue. You can see the same procedure and we take away the last bit of the, uh, the, the membrane and the blood and after that uh, flatten it using perfluorocarbon uh, like a giant tear. 360 laser and then oil. This is the post-op picture of this patient. Uh, you can see the comparative views and, and and the retina gets flat. So when there is such a thick tissue of blood, you, you need a surgery like this. This is another case you see, uh, there's a vitreous hemorrhage with uh, what you see on the ultrasound as a collection of subretinal blood. We could not uh, visualize it, but on table after clearing the hemorrhage, you can see that there is a thick collection of, of blood which is there. So once again here, we do a, a full vitrectomy and then expose the, the temporal area and then do the same type of procedure. So I'm showing you a similar type of cases because this is something which can be uh, replicated to an extent for any tissue which has very thick blood. But of course, a thinner amount of blood which is there, you could use gas positioning, TPAs, other things. But here, this thick tissue, because a lot of them also have membranes uh, here, uh, which create uh, uh, a lot of thickened tissue, which is not going to flatten, where the retina is not going to flatten over it. So here I put some perfluorocarbon to just clear up some of the blood, which was trapped in some of the peripheral areas of the subretinal area. So I just pushed some perfluorocarbon and then re-aspirated so that all that blood also uh, came in. And after that, put the perfluorocarbon on top, removed it. You can see that the thick membrane was still lying and I, I then took it away with the cutter. So this is the, the calcific membrane uh, which was underlying along with that mixed blood. But in the end, you see a good flat retina uh, and, and then treat it like a giant tear. This is the, the view of the first post-op day uh, in that patient. Of course, when you do an autofluorescence and IR imaging, you can see an atrophic patch in the center. So of course, all these patients tend to have some sort of an atrophy uh, in, in that region. Now I'll show you a, a smaller size thick blood collection um, where we do surgery. And here I do a localized posterior retinectomy uh, instead of something uh, much larger because those cases had a much larger, almost like creating a detachment. Uh, and, and those are ideal for what I showed you. But this one uh, is, is posteriorly located. But of course, first of all, you do a vitreous removal, a hyaloid removal carefully. And here you can see that I'm trying to do a localized, very fine diathermy just under the inferior arcade, within the inferior arcade, which is where underneath is the blood as well as a membrane uh, lying in that area. And after that, I use a cutter. The cutter is at a very low cut rate of 100 cuts a minute. Uh, this is a 7,500 cutter, but I've reduced it to 100. So it's very controlled. It's like a scissor. It just goes cut, 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 uh, so that you don't inadvertently cut more tissue than required. So, so you have a small smiley shaped incision and then once uh, you have exposure to the underlying membrane and blood, you use high vacuum and, and gradually uh, uh, remove this by a gentle rocking motion using the suction of the cutter to hold it uh, well. And you can see that the whole complex of the blood as well as uh, this whole tissue will gradually come off. So the size of the incision has to be made carefully because you have to uh, imagine the size which is going to be bigger than what it seems like and 
uh, otherwise your retinectomy retinotomy may tear apart now you see a smiley shaped incision with some residual blood there which we are aspirating now uh, gradually putting some perflow carbon to flatten and then expose that blood and and clear it up and just do a very mild laser to the a single row laser uh, to that uh, margin because this is a macular area and you don't want to do too much laser to that tissue so this is how it looks like the fovea is not too bad uh, this is the incision site you see uh, at the, within the arcade but as we go close towards the fovea the tissue looks uh, uh, is quite normal this is a month after uh, the surgery you can see the comparative views of, of this case uh, this is a wide field view uh, another case similar where there is a posterior located blood and and you see uh, a thick collection in the posterior pole so once again you you finish doing and then do uh, i'm going a little away here the blood is going beyond the arcade upper arcade so i'm going a bit beyond uh, in anticipation of clear it for a larger area so that this whole tissue can come out together and then of course get a good hold on that bulk of tissue and uh, and 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 you can see that the whole chunk comes out uh, together uh, and and once as soon as it comes out you put perflow carb perflow carbon so that the posterior pole is stabilized and then you can eat away uh, this whole tissue clear all the muck uh, and then do a mild laser to that periphery and and settle it so this is something again replicable uh, you do a incision but is away from the fovea now this was a, a different type of case i went in with an idea of doing a large retinectomy but when i went in i saw large choroidals in the periphery and i i thought it unwise to do a retinectomy here because it may create more problems for me so i ended up following a procedure of injecting some uh, a air bubble inside you can see that i'm i'm uh, just injecting some air bubble uh, inside and after that uh, and replace the vitreous cavity fluid do an air fluid exchange so put air you make an air filled cavity and also put um, air bubbles in the uh, in the subretinal space and and then i just left it uh, uh, with this idea of displacing it and uh, this is how it looked like the next day actually uh, not too bad given the situation of the amount of blood and the choroidals and then gradually it did uh, clear up uh so so this is something which can also work in some situations where the blood is not too thick but this one had choroidal sign so uh, obviously i couldn't do a retinectomy here in this case one example of a post buckling submacular hemorrhage uh, this patient had come to us had been buckled elsewhere and had developed a, a subretinal hemorrhage so this is not an on table uh, situation we were doing it after a few days and uh, when the patient came to us it was Uh, a subretinal hemorrhage but it was liquefied it was still not uh, clotted or anything and we could very easily uh, just make a small uh, uh, retinotomy posteriorly and aspirate it uh, so so this was a, a different type of uh, blood consistency that you see in a case which probably had developed a submacular hemorrhage following a, a drainage procedure so this was the post op view of this particular patient where the blood cleared quite uh, effectively so these are some of the cases and the techniques that i've followed so far uh, for larger thicker blood where um, uh, i guess one has to use some sort of a surgical modality uh, one could use a mix and match of uh, tpa gas others as well a uh, lot of people have different experiences but i think surgery works effectively for some of these situations uh, i wish we were all together like this from a previous by our meeting together enjoying uh the wonderful weather and the sea and but but i'm sure we will be able to do it sometime in the future but for now thank you very much for having me here and thank you for a patient uh, hearing thank you very much